Senator Batters. Honorable Senators, I rise oh, to sorry, speak. Sorry, Senator Batters. Senator Lankin, did you wish to ask a question? Yes, I did. Well, Senator McFedrin's time has expired. She'll have to ask for five that, minutes. That's fine. I'll leave it. It's late. You leave it? Okay. I'll call her. Sorry, <laughs> Senator Batters. Honourable Senators, I rise to speak to this Emergencies Act motion. What a sad day it is, Honourable Senators, that it has come to this, that this Trudeau government has invoked and employed the Emergencies Act on Canadian citizens before it could even be voted on in Parliament. Tear gas and batons and lines of police to shove back protesters chanting for freedom. Truck windows smashed, bank accounts frozen, frozen promises to hunt down even those who chose to leave the protest voluntarily. And even now, with the bridge, blockade, bridge blockades in Ottawa's protests cleared, the Prime Minister can't tell us when the Emergencies Act and its extensive government powers will be lifted, only that his government plans to make some of the features of those extensive powers permanent. The incredible division among Canadians in this moment is largely of Prime Minister Trudeau's own making. He and his government have divided Canadians among themselves, vaxxed and unvaxxed, and through his incendiary language, turned them on one another. From the time of the election onwards, Prime Minister Trudeau has used this public health emergency as a political wedge issue, without regard for the Canadians in the middle who have become collateral damage. He has called them extremists, racists, and says they are misogynists. Prime Minister Trudeau preaches tolerance, but says those who chose not to be vaccinated against COVID-19, quote, take up room, and questions, quote, do we tolerate these people? And when these Canadians, in many cases Canadians who have lost much or have lost everything as a result of COVID-19 mandates, land on Parliament's doorstep to have their voices heard, what does the Prime Minister do? Instead of hearing them out or empathizing with the frustration they are feeling, he doubles down and calls them a, quote, fringe minority with unacceptable views. And so each side dug in, and we wound up with a three-week protest in front of Parliament and the unnecessary overreach of the Emergencies Act by this government. Let us not forget that it was Prime Minister Trudeau who counseled Indian Prime Minister Modi to engage in dialogue when 50,000 farmers blockaded the roads to New Delhi in 2020, a protest that went on for a year. Prime Minister Trudeau boasted, quote, Canada will always be there to defend the right of peaceful protest, quote. Yet he has refused from the get-go to engage in dialogue with the blue-collar working people who were demonstrating right here on Wellington Street. Honourable Senators, throughout this pandemic, we have been fortunate to still collect our paychecks, to maintain access to our health plans and other benefits, to be able to work remotely from the comfort of our homes when necessary. Many of the people living in this public service city and downtown have also been fortunate. But there are other Canadians who have had a very different experience during this pandemic. Many have lost their jobs, their businesses and their livelihoods, some as the result of circumstance, others due to vaccine mandates. The financial loss, the social isolation, the vilification promoted by the government, it's all resulted in a growing frustration that has culminated in the trucker convoy and blockades we've seen across the country. In Saskatchewan and Alberta, where many of these truckers came from, people were already suffering economic devastation prior to this pandemic because of the anti-energy policies of the Trudeau government. The ever-ballooning carbon tax is a further burden. Meanwhile, the oil and gas industry has been vilified in this country. Only last week in BC, we saw protesters violently attack the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline work camp with axes and terrorize workers, and certainly with no discussion of invoking the Emergencies Act in response from the government. And while the movement started from a place of resistance to vaccine mandates, it quickly expanded to become about freedom more generally. And that the more the government and the Prime Minister in Ottawa spoke divisively against the protesters, demonizing them and refusing to listen, the wider and more expansive the movement became. Before I go too much further, let me be clear. I empathize with the residents of downtown Ottawa who have been most acutely affected by the protest here. They have had their lives and livelihoods disrupted. Understandably, they wanted it to end. This intrusion into their lives came at the tail end of having suffered through this pandemic, perhaps the most stressful, traumatic two years of many of our lives. And then to have to deal with this, the blaring horns all hours, day and night, the obstruction, who among us wouldn't be saying enough is enough? My office faces right onto Wellington Street, and I had a front row seat to this convoy for the past few weeks. And what I can tell you is that I, what I witnessed of protesters was peaceful, organized, and non-threatening. I do not tolerate harassment, intimidation, or destruction ever. But I can honestly say that I, personally, did not see any of that behavior exhibited by the protesters. 
I have been here in Ottawa during all three weeks of the protest, and I can say that in the last two years, I never felt safer walking home from my office at night. The protesters I met very much reminded me of the people I know in Saskatchewan, friendly, hardworking, patriotic Canadians. But I sensed in the discussions about the protesters in the media and among the privileged chattering classes on Parliament Hill almost a fear of these working class people who had invaded the city. Ottawa's mayor called them yahoos and idiots. Others online maligned them as Nazis and terrorists. Everyone had an opinion about them, but certainly no one was talking with them. It was widely reported that I posed in a photograph at the protest alongside my MP caucus colleagues from Saskatchewan during the protest's first week. There were no protesters in the photo. There was an empty truck in the background with Saskatchewan's flags on it. Certainly nothing offensive, but in the Ottawa media, this was considered controversial. We went to talk to some of the Saskatchewan truckers who congregated on Kent Street from towns like Stoughton, Southie, Kerryville, Carndiff and Birch Hills. These truckers are our constituents, and that is our job as parliamentarians to hear them out, to engage with those we represent, to listen to their concerns. They drove all the way to Ottawa from those Saskatchewan towns. Birch Hills is almost 3,000 kilometres, or a 32-hour drive away, to simply have a conversation, like Prime Minister Trudeau will advise other world leaders to do, but which he obstinately refused to do, himself when faced with the same situation here in Canada's capital. Like so many other situations, what this Prime Minister sanctimoniously prescribes for others, he refuses to apply for himself. To be sure, the Emergencies Act is intense legislation for a government to invoke. It should only be used as a last resort when no other laws can deal with a national security threatening issue effectively. I submit that this Ottawa convoy falls well short of that bar. In the past, when this act, or more accurately its precursor, the War Measures Act was invoked, it was in relation to World War I, World War II and the FLQ crisis, which involved the murder and kidnapping of public officials and ongoing terrorist activities. These are the only times similar legislation was employed in the past. What is the national emergency this time? Dance parties and loud horns? Horns that, by the way, had long since stopped honking by the time this act was invoked due to a court injunction that the truckers complied with. Honourable Senators, just remember that when this government is long gone and another takes its place of a stripe you may not agree with. The Trudeau government has now set this as the precedent for invoking the Emergencies Act. Bouncy castles, loud horns, raucous partying and illegal parking in a four-block radius of downtown Ottawa. It's annoying, to be sure, but is this a national emergency? The federal government made no moves to resolve the Ottawa protest for three weeks, while the protesters were mere feet from the front door of West Block. If the situation were truly such a grave threat to national security that it rose to the level of employing the Emergencies Act, one would expect the federal government would have acted in some way, any way, to resolve it but they did not. Prime Minister Trudeau simply refuses to meet with protesters, then brought in the Emergencies Act as a first, not a last resort. When Deputy Prime Minister Freeland spoke on the issue, she said that the government used all the tools it had prior to the invocation of the act. What tools? Name calling? The Prime Minister disappearing for days on end? More name calling? What tools? The same tools they used for the railway blockades in 2020 that went on for 19 days and for which the government still never invoked the Emergencies Act? When the Prime Minister announced that he was engaging the Emergencies Act, he told Canadians it would be in a geographically targeted way, applicable only to those within the zones specified. Yet we see in reality the federal government's massive overreach in the proclamation declaring a public order emergency, which states that the public order emergency will apply, quote, throughout Canada. Several of the Premiers opposed the use of the Emergencies Act to deal with this situation, including Premier Scott Moe of my home province of Saskatchewan. Many legal experts agree this situation fails to meet the threshold for exercising the Emergencies Act. Among them are constitutional law professor Dwight Newman and the ARL, Advocates for the Rule of Law, Amnesty International, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the BC Civil Liberties Association, and even Paul Champ, the lawyer for those who successfully sought the court injunction against the horn honking of the Ottawa protest. They all agree this situation didn't require the Emergencies Act. Last week, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association announced that it is taking the Government of Canada to court over the invocation of this act. 
The CCLA's Executive Director, Noah Mendelson Aviv, called the use of the Emergencies Act in this situation unprecedented and a serious infringement of the charter rights of Canadians. She stated that by invoking the Emergencies Act, the government would be giving itself, quote, enormous powers to bypass the ordinary, accountable democratic process, quote. Mendelssohn went on to call peaceful assembly, which by any measure this protest has been, quote, a critical democratic tool. The BCCLA organization has further pointed out that the Emergencies Act should not be a stopgap measure to address the inaction of municipal police forces and provincial authorities. To be clear, they stated governments have ample legal authorities without using the Emergencies Act. Even Paul Champ, who I indicated was the Ottawa lawyer who went to court to put a halt to the incessant honking of horns by the truckers, agrees that the use of the Emergencies Act in this situation was government overreach, quote, Although I am acutely aware of the trauma experienced by Ottawa residents, I fully agree that the Emergencies Act is a dangerous tool that was not required, quote. Many legal experts shared a concern that by invoking the Emergencies Act for the Ottawa protest, the Trudeau government is normalizing the extraordinary law's usage. The BCCLA warns that the invocation of the Act in this instance sets a dangerous precedent if our elected officials become comfortable with using excessive powers to target dissent in Canada. It becomes easier to use again, they argue, to stifle other movements such as Black Lives Matter or Indigenous land or water defenders. The Advocates for the Rule of Law, or ARL, agree that this situation sets a dangerous precedent, quote, normalizing the declaration of emergencies, especially before other less intrusive but still significant measures have been attempted, threatens to render hollow the rights and freedoms guaranteed to all Canadians. It risks a gradual erosion of Parliament's role in favour of executive power, and it amounts to a damning admission of a failure of state capacity, quote. But there is some evidence that normalizing emergencies may be the Trudeau government's intention. Deputy Prime Minister Freeland has recently spoke of making some tools in the Act permanent. We should all be worried about that, Honourable Senators. For all its raucousness and disruption of traffic in downtown Ottawa, can anyone seriously believe this protest was a threat to Canada's national security? Some will say it spawned blockades at the Ambassador Bridge, disrupting one of our main trade routes with the United States. But that blockade, and similarly the one in Alberta, were dispersed peacefully and non-violently, and most importantly, without recourse to the Emergencies Act. Meanwhile, both Houses of Parliament were able to meet for weeks, mere steps away from the protesters. Prime Minister Trudeau and his senior cabinet ministers attended several question periods and House of Commons sittings in the West Block in person. If there were a true public order emergency, surely none of that would have been allowed to have occurred. Honourable Senators, consider all of the moments of crisis in Canada since 1988, and yet the Emergencies Act was not invoked for any of those occasions. Not for the standoff at Oka, not for 9-11 in which 25 Canadians were killed, not even during the October 2014 Parliament Hill shooting, and I remember that well because I was locked in a caucus room for 10 hours with my colleagues throughout. None of those situations required the use of the Emergencies Act. I fear that with this invocation, we are embarking on a slippery slope away from what Canada is famous for, its unwavering adherence to the principles of freedom and justice. These principles are why immigrants from around the world long to come to Canada. That is the reason so many of our ancestors came here, to escape tyranny. That is why my grandparents came to Canada from Ukraine 100 years ago. This country, this parliamentary system, this Westminster system, was founded out of the rejection of tyranny. The Fathers of the Confederation feared not just the tyranny of the monarch, but the tyranny of the majority. And we in the Senate are a key part of that system, to stand up for the minority, to be their voice. It has not been lost on me, nor should it be on any of you, that this building, now the Senate of Canada building, where I deliver this speech today, is the very building where our Charter of Rights and Freedoms was negotiated. Think of that history, Honourable Senators, when you consider whether to allow this federal government to trample all over that Charter. People on both sides of the political spectrum have expressed the view that the Trudeau government's invocation of the Emergencies Act in this situation is considerable government overreach. And at this time, I am reminded of the words of William F. Buckley Jr., quote, the best defense against usurpatory government is an assertive citizenry, quote. We need to assert ourselves, honorable senators, and reject this unprecedented authoritarian overreach by this federal government. Please join me in voting no to this Emergencies Act motion. Thank you. Thank you.